So today, I gosh, today's a, a couple of fun chapters. Uh, so uh, you know, always come, keepers always come with my notes. Yeah, right. Uh, I was telling telling some colleagues Wednesday is the day that I talked to my. I'm really blessed uh, that uh, I have an ongoing uh, conference call with four colleagues that we went to seminary together. And uh, we get together, and so I've, I've joked, uh, my sermons are ghost-written by my colleagues. Uh, many many things get said, uh, and vice versa. They've told me, to, like, watch the video, because I get quoted. Um, not cited, not <laughs> but quoted. Uh, uh, um, but anyway, I was telling them that, you know, last year, I, I, you know, Mark is such a... I love Mark so much, and I know Mark almost like the back of my hand. Uh, it's the one that I spend the most time in, um, and uh, I can kind of roll into Mark, you know, 20 minutes ahead of time, read the chapter, and ready to go. John takes a lot of notes, <laughs> lots of research to be able to get them. But uh, but today's some really fun, some really fun chapters. So. Um, if, if no one has any questions or just comments, one, yeah, sure. Just one quick thing. Yeah. So, timeline. Yeah. So, as he's doing the first miracle, on, are we talking his, like, are we getting into his third year of ministry? Like, you know what I mean? Because like, this is the start of this. Yeah. That's a really great, that's a really great question. So, that is the tradition. That is the tradition, right? That Jesus' ministry lasted about three years. But in none of the Gospels does it say, this is year one, this is year two, this is year three. Um, you know what? I'd have to look up to see where that three-year number came from. I don't think it was so much that in as where we are in, like, in his journey of actually with the disciples and all that, like, yeah, you know, where are we like right today before we do the 5,000, you know, are we going into year three? Are we still in year two of the big ministry part or just wait till we get to the end and it'll fun? Well, that's what I'm trying to say, Shay. I don't know if we're in year two or three, or we, we're in year seven. So we're in because we don't know, timeline. we don't know the timeline. Oh. What we do know is the geography. Sometimes the they're, they're so kind, but John and I want to reiterate this again: chronology and is not important to John. And so jumping from Jerusalem to Galilee and back again in a matter of like a sentence, that's that's a journey on foot. That's a real journey. So we don't know exactly how long that took, how many nights he spent out, you know, doing something else. Um, so I don't, I can't answer that for you. I'm really sorry. I don't know what year we're in. Um, but none of the gospels, none of the gospels right. say, give us a timeline. It's not a diary, right? Yeah. You know, dear diary. Oh, I know. On year, on year, and, this, and, and let's also be clear. Time, time was, time is relative. And the idea that, um the meticulous timekeeping that we do in the 21st century wasn't it wasn't the same thing in the first century uh, they they didn't have working clocks that way but yeah it's a, that's a good word sherry say that louder focus on, the doing. focus on the doing i think that's probably the way to go so unfortunately i can't answer that question for us okay uh what we do know is that jesus was in uh was was in Ju uh, Judea or close to uh or close to Jerusalem he went back up to Galilee and now uh he's at the uh, he's at the sea of Galilee and he's about to and he's going to cross over to the uh to the eastern side so you know let's do the thing right you, you know so let's do the whole Michigan can thing like this like this which way did it go like this like this we're right here. Which, by the way, it's not for the video, but I gotta tell you the story about my roommate in seminary being from West Virginia. It's the funniest thing ever. Uh, but because uh, they have a hand signal that's very different from from the, from the from the wonderful hand that we use. Uh, but uh, so anyway, so let's say uh, Jerusalem is about right here. 
uh, uh, Galilee is up here, and the Sea of Galilee is over here on, on, on this side. And so, and then on the other side of that is where we find Jesus today. So he was on the east side of the Sea of Galilee, and he goes over to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which actually puts him very close to Gentile territory, but not in Gentile territory, but very close to it. Um, and so what we have here is the fourth sign. So remember in the Gospel of John, um, we, uh, we don't have... Uh, we don't have miracles. We have signs. These are opportunities for Jesus to um, utilize um, doings. These Sherry's word, I love that. Uh, to ex explore and to and to reveal his, the the glory um, of God through him through the, what he's doing. And so, what we have today is a miracle. Voice quality is poor. Try moving closer to the mic. Or to a quieter location. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what to do with that. Are y'all hearing online okay? Not. Yeah, are you hearing okay? Okay, all right, then I'm not going to worry about it. So um, <laughs> what we have here today is the fourth sign is a sign slash miracle that is found in all four Gospels. And anything that shows up in all four Gospels should really be taken seriously because it means that it was such an important story and event that it spoke to all the different segments and all the different uh, sects of early Christianity. So the feeding of the 5,000, and there's a couple, there's one very uh, interesting detail that I wanted to start with, which is in the synoptic gospels, that's Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it is reported that Jesus fed 5,000 men. Mm. But in the Gospel of John, it's reported that Jesus has fed 5,000 people. And that is because as you're reading through the Gospel of John, and particularly once you start getting to the latter half of the Gospel, I hope you will recognize how valued and affirmed women were in John's community. There are more stories of Jesus interacting with women and women having prominent roles in the life of Jesus, from his mother to the woman at the Samaritan well, to Mary and Martha, to Mary Magdalene, to you know the, the whole gambit, um, and very and vast details of those experiences that Jesus has with women. And so in the Gospel of John, we have in a very slight, subtle way, an affirmation of the role that women played in, in, in John's community in early Christianity. So, um, so it's a small detail, one that we might look over very subtle. It's a very subtle detail that we might overlook if we weren't aware that in the other three Gospels, uh, it's, it says that Jesus fed 5,000 men, uh, not 5,000 people. So, so I just want to give a little shout out to John. Uh, for, for that. But also you might want to, uh, it might be very interesting for you to know that the two uh, most prominent symbols or iconography to, to identify the Christian community in uh, the first century was the tree of life and the loaves and fishes. Uh, the, the cross doesn't become the dominant symbol for Christianity until the late second century. So uh, 180, 190 is when it starts to become prominent, and it doesn't become the official symbol of Christianity until Constantine, the Roman emperor, converts to Christianity, and he starts placing the, the, the cross on the Roman Roman uh, shields and Roman sigils, and that's when it becomes the official symbol of Christianity. But before the cross as the symbol was the tree of life and the loaves and fishes. And there is a chapel built on the east side of the Sea of Galilee, which is dedicated to this story. And it has one of the oldest mosaics 
in, in, in complete form uh in that chapel and it is of the loaves and fishes now it's not from the first century it's not that old uh but it is uh one of the oldest complete uh works of mosaic art uh from the first four centuries of christianity and it's really beautiful so if you ever get a chance to go to israel or Pal israel and palestine uh it is not as trafficked as jerusalem and you can go up to the Sea of Galilee and walk through this beautiful chapel and see this amazing piece of art. Um, so the uh, John's version of the gospel is really detailed, um, where I think in chapter six and seven, you get a piece. I just want to take a second and say you get a real sense of the author's literary narrative uh, abilities. Like this is almost novellic in the way that it's written. Uh, you have so much detail, some interaction between characters, uh, people not Jesus talking. Uh, <laughs> I can't tell you how, how uh, not Markin that is. Those of you who went through Mark know that nobody else talks except for Jesus in the Gospel of Mark, and he hardly says anything. Um, and so, uh, but in here we get this dialogue back and forth between Jesus and the disciples. Jesus, uh, and who has the who has the loaves and fishes? The little boy. It's a little child, right? It's a little child. Um, and so, uh, in the other gospels, it just it says just says Jesus says, "Well, what do the people have?" You have no idea where those loaves and fishes are coming from. Here, it comes from one specific little boy. Um, which I don't know if there's any significance to that or not. I couldn't find anything, but it's a, it's a fun little detail. Um, so, so we so, but the other thing to keep in mind uh, around this story is the numerology. So um, there are some very significant numbers in this story that um, that I'd like to lift up to you. So. Five loaves and two fishes is the number seven. Seven is a perfect number. Where, I mean, when you think of the number seven, what do you think of? In, in Christianity, what, num what, what, what would immediately your mind be drawn to? Seven days. Seven days of? Mm -hmm. what? Okay, seven days of the week. What else? Creation. Creation. Seven days of creation, right? Uh, so, uh, God's creation, uh, was complete in seven days. Uh, and so that's why it's considered a perfect number. And so, um, so there is, so that would symbolize that in these two, uh, five loaves and two fishes, there is enough, right? It is complete. There is an abundance because it is to it is to evoke this spirit of creation. Uh, and again, with John, who is Jesus, Jesus is the Logos, the Word. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And all things came into being through him. And so here is the Lord of creation using creation to provide abundance for everyone. There is enough for everyone, so much so that another number pops up. What's that number? Twelve. And if you, and what does that evoke? Disciples and the tribes of Israel, right? And twelve becomes a number to represent the nations or the world. And so here is the Logos, Jesus using creation to provide abundance, so much so that not only is there enough for everyone on the hillside uh, at the Sea of uh, Galilee, but there is enough over, there's so much abundance that it could feed the entire world. Uh, and so, and this will come into play a little bit later when we get this whole discourse on the bread of uh, uh, on the yeah the bread of life discourse right so uh, a really important story uh, that in the gospel of john i think takes on even greater significance due to the philosophical um, nature of john's understanding of jesus as 
not just sent of God, but of God, right? Jesus, John is so clear from the very beginning that Jesus isn't just sent by God, but is of God. Um, and it's very important to that. So question, hey, Roger, you always scare me when you're hanging over, like hovering like that. Do you have a question? No, you're okay, all right. <laughs> when Roger hovers, I'm worried that he has a question. Uh, anything else? Yeah, sure. So in 11, where he says, when he took the loaves and he gave things, instead of blessing it, is that a teaching that is from God, instead of him blessing it, he's thanking God and showing them, like, God is where it's kind of coming from? I think that's a good way of looking at it. I think also another way of looking at it is the, the traditional the grace. He's just giving a grace before the meal. Then Jesus took the loaves and he, uh, and when he had given thanks. So the, the traditional Jewish prayer is Baruch Atai Adonai Eloheinu Malach Olam um, uh, 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 blessed are you, O God, creator of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. And that's the that's the traditional Jewish grace. Um, and so I think I think that's what he's doing there, Sherry, is he's just he's just saying grace before he passes it among the people. Uh, but it is a it is a grace giving thanks to God for you know for this. Um and then, obviously, when the people uh, experience this, they see, they see this is indeed the prophet who has come into the world. And what prophet they are talking about? It, 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 the, the, the season of the prophets, had, they were thought to have come to an end by this point. So it could be, uh, it could be that they're talking about the Messiah. They, it could be that they're talking about Elijah, um, who was to bring in the new um be a forebearer harbinger for the for the messiah but uh, but i think it's just a way of saying like oh my gosh what's going on this is this is so amazing but notice the very next line 15 when jesus realized that they were they were to come and take him by force to make him king he withdrew again up by the mountain by himself so you may or may not does anyone know this uh, um what's does anyone know the story of Solomon and um, I'm sorry, not Solomon, Samuel and um, and anointing the first king Saul? Is, do I do I need to explain that real quick? Okay, let me explain that real quick. So when um, after the Israelites left Egypt uh, and they entered into Canaan and uh, and they uh, started to um, to, to live there, there were, uh, there was, um, a lot of battles and a lot of, op a lot of times that people were trying to take the land back. And, and it was a very, and that's the book of judges, right? And it's a very bloody book. Uh, it really is. It, it reads like game of Thrones. Uh, it really does. Uh, they're just, there might even be a dragon somewhere in there. Uh, but it, the, um, um, basically what happened is it's such a bloody, violent, warful time that the, the people say, we'll have peace if we have a king. And, and Samuel keeps telling the people, you don't need a king, you don't need a king, you don't need a king. And finally, Samuel, through a conversation with God, relents and says, okay, I will find you a king. And that's what leads to the anointing of Saul to be the first king of Israel that then leads to David and, and, and okay. Um, but that idea that, uh, things will be better if we just have a king, like, I, I think there's something or, or a ruler, right? If someone, if someone will just take care of us, like, right. And there is, and, and so I think that's a lot of what we see in verse 15 is that sentiment of if we just had, if we just had somebody in this, in this role, everything would be taken care of. Uh, and Jesus immediately rejects that idea that this isn't about me ruling over you. I'm teaching you how to live. And this is, and this is going to be, I'm going to give you something better than a king. Um, and so, um, and so, but, but does this reinforce their thought that the king would 
um, and lead. I mean, that's what I got when I read this. Yeah. They're, they haven't gotten past what they think the king is going to be. Yeah, that warrior king. Yeah. Yeah, who's going to lead them into freedom in, in, a, in a way that's in a, in a different sort of manner than what Jesus has in mind in terms of messiahship. Dig, you about to add something? No, I was oh, okay. I thought you were stretching about to... my eye. Oh, okay. <laughs> all right, all right. As long as you're not yawning, we're all right. All right. Any questions online about that? So I think that there's just a really interesting, like, again, there's there's so much in these two chapters, but I think that's such an important line to remember that even though Jesus is not uh, being secretive about who he is in John, he is still very much trying to invert the idea of what a Messiah is. Um, and then we get Jesus walking on water, but do you, do you know, if you know, you're walking on water stories, there's a big omission in John's yeah. version. Anybody get, catch the omission in John's version? Peter. Peter. Yeah. There is no Peter. Why Doris do you think there's no Peter? John would not have thought it was important. Why would John not have thought <laughs> Peter was important? Because <laughs> he wasn't right. He could. John was writing it. And... Do you, are you thinking that there might have been a rivalry between the John community and the Peter community? <laughs> between the disciples Jesus loved and Peter. Are you, what do you mean? I... <laughs> Doris, I think you're on to something. I think you're on to something. Um, there is good scholarship out there to think that the Peter omission is not by accident that the story every other version of the walking on water story has peter involved uh, and 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 this is the only version of the story that doesn't have peter involved and good scholars think that john was doing that on purpose to needle the peter the peter people now by the time by the time john is written peter is well dead uh, John, again, we date John 95 to 105. Uh, Peter died probably 65 to 68. Uh, so Peter's been dead for 30 years. So that's a grudge. <laughs> if you can't let go of a grudge after 30 years of the guy being dead, uh, that's a grudge. Uh, but um, but that's not on that's not by accident. So the focus, though, is I don't know who said it. The focus is on Jesus. Right. Um, and, and and what Jesus is doing. And even though this is not an official sign, according to the Gospel of John, it is yet another example of Jesus's control over creation. So I, I hate to beat this into us, but Jesus being the logos and the word that was with God and the word that was with God in the, in the beginning and everything came into being through the word. Now we have. <laughs> What's that, Mike? Does that? So why isn't this a sign? I don't know why this isn't a sign, but it's not an official sign according to the Gospel of John. Oh, I mean, how many people were in walk on water? <laughs> I agree. I, the first <laughs> I agree. I think it might be because not enough people see it. Oh, okay. so it's a very limited amount of people who see Jesus walking out, whereas the other signs are all very public is I would guess that's the reason why it's not considered a sign. But again, Jesus controls the, the creation as a way to verify who he is. And if you know your, if you know your Genesis 1, what's the first thing God has to do to start creating? In the beginning, when God began to create, God created the heavens and the earth and water, right and it was what do you know the word chaotic hmm. there was the water was chaotic meaning it was storm it was waves it was wind it was thunderstorms and now so now we have jesus who is the word who is with god who was god and and all things came into being through him first thing he's the, jesus is not worried about chaos on the on the water because as connected with god that's already happened. That he, he's got that, and so um, so John is yet again reinforcing who this person is through the story of walking on the water. 
Yeah. yeah. Doris. Are there any other gospels that say my my version here says immediately the boat reached the shore? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed that. No, this is the first, this is the only gospel that we know that jet propulsion is one of Jesus's. One of Jesus's. Yes, right. You get this sense of Jesus like getting behind the boat and starting kicking, right? Stuff. It's it's really kind of a fun story. But no, it's the only one that we have that where like immediately they get we we seem to have conveniently forgot that Jesus also just disappeared. Yeah, that's right. Invisibility is also I mean in the mountains. I mean he's he's here with he's in the mountains and they Two seconds. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Can I ask you a yeah. question? Um, just because right now life's a little hectic, the yeah. teaching and coaching and stuff. Right. Um, and you guys talking about this, and you brought up the water being chaos. Is yeah. this like a metaphor for like life? Like yeah. life can be chaos, and then you look to Jesus and they have right. I think actually one of the most beautiful, it's actually not this version of the story, but it's the one where the, the disciples are in the boat and he comes in. Uh, no, it's the one where he's asleep in the boat. That's actually my favorite version okay. of this. And uh, the, the storms are raging and the, and the disciples are all like freaking out. Uh -huh. And the word that Jesus speaks is peace. And it, like everything calms down. And like I do think one of the most beautiful ways to interpret that story is allegory to like our own lives that when the the, the storms of life are raging like mm -hmm. it's part of us is to find that that place of peace within us and like and and how christ is um one of those is that place where we can find that peace right. yeah i do think that's exactly right peace in the chaos is yeah because we might not have control over it like Jesus, but we can find peace within it. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Which takes discipline. Like, I'm not saying that that's easy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I make yeah. it sound like, just find peace. No, it's, 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 it's just, connected. just be peaceful. Uh, like, if it was that easy. All right. So then I'm going to do some kind of jump around or, or, or move this a little bit faster uh, because... Um, I, I want to move us on to the bread of life, uh, to verse 35. Um, and, and, and I just kind of want to go through this and, and, and give you some, some background here so that you can kind of wrap your heads around it if you were struggling, because this is really uh, an important discourse in the Gospel of John, um, and it takes the place of the Last Supper. So there is no Last Supper in the Gospel of John. We will not we will not read that story in this gospel. Um, so this discourse that Jesus has uh, kind of replaces that conversation that he has with the God, with the disciples around the Passover table um, in, in the synoptic gospels. Um, but um, so this is so for that reason, this is a very pivotal, pivotal moment in the, in the gospel. So, in a nutshell, what I think that Jesus is saying by saying that he is the bread of life is that Jesus is God's spiritual gift of sustenance for our time and for eternity. Just like bread fills us up physically, Jesus fills us up spiritually. Um, and, um, I think I read this a lot and like, that's the best I could come up with was like bread fills up our body. Jesus fills up our spirit. Um, and that, and that spiritual sustenance is a, a, a now gift, but also a gift for the eternity. Um, and and then he uses this understanding, or he uses the stories that the people would be familiar with, like manna from heaven, um, as um, as a way to sort of bring the people on board by by what he's saying, um, saying that the manna from heaven was 
Um, so if you're not if you're not familiar with that story, when the the Israelites left Egypt, they were out in the wilderness for 40 years. Uh, they didn't have they were struggling for food. Many of them were hungry. Moses prayed to God for God to provide, and God provided manna um, each and every morning, which the, the the Israelites had to go out and collect. That's one of the things I think people forget about that story is we always think that the manna just dropped in their laps and they're like, oh, look, you know, manna. But no, the manna was always dropped way over there and they had to go out and collect it. And if they didn't do their part every single day, then they wouldn't have gotten. Yeah. And so it was it was this it was this kind of cooperation between God and the people to get them fed. But um, it, it was a gift from God. It was a gift from God. And, and Jesus is kind of saying, I'm that gift now for you, just like the manna was a gift that came down from heaven. I'm that gift now that comes down from heaven. And hopefully you're catching on that so many people are taking him literally. Like there's another group of people who take his, uh, they're like, wait a second, how can you come from down from heaven? We know you came from like Galilee. It was like, we know your mom and dad. Yeah. Like <laughs> we know where you came from. Um, and so they, and so this, everyone taking him so literally is, I think, I, it's a running joke throughout the Gospel of John. It's really actually kind of funny. Um, well, but I said, I read this, so Doubting Thomas continues to live on. <laughs> I mean, truthfully, yeah, I have known you, right, and your family. Right, and right. Really? You think you're this? Right, 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 right. And so, so, yeah, so it's so good. Um, but there's a very important line that I want to, to move you towards. Uh, verse 37 of God, uh, chapel, cha chapter 6. Um, everyone that comes, uh, everything that, that the Father gives me uh, will come to me, and everyone who comes to me, I will never drive away. Oh. And so here is a very important point and think about who comes to jesus i wrote down a few of them blind beggars lepers pharisees wealthy aristocrats roman soldiers all of them come to jesus at one point or another in the gospel so let's add samaritan women uh all of these people come to jesus at one point during the gospel and he rejects none of them and so this idea of the of the of the wide table of of the, the the radical inclusivity of Jesus is played out here. Uh, there is not uh, there is very few people that Jesus really re at any point rejects, uh, and most of them are usually doing injustice to others. Um, and so this is a very important line that he will reject no one who come who comes to him. I think. Uh, yeah, I that's I'm I must be reading a different thing than you are, because what I what it says where I'm reading it is the only people that come to me were sent by God anyway. Right, and that's so it, you know how, how are you going to reject somebody that's sent by God? I I don't see that he's saying anybody that comes to me, whatever that means, I'm never going to reject you. He's saying that you don't, the, the, those of you who don't believe in me, uh, those of you who find this teaching hard and this kind of stuff, is because you weren't sent by the Father to begin with. I mean, so how is that saying, I will re can never reject anyone? But who has he rejected yet? He doesn't have to if they reject him. Well, right. But I'm saying... <laughs> I don't understand what you're trying to say. That he doesn't say that. There, he just doesn't say, "If you come to me, I will never reject you." He says, first of all, the only people that come to me have been sent to me by the Father." Right. Well, so of course, people... he's not going to reject them. What choice does he have? If God sent them to him, who's he to reject? Them? But the point I'm trying to make is the wide variety of people who have come to him is what it, that, that they obviously felt something and it, there is no barrier to him. These, these people just rode across the, the Sea of Tiberias to find him in Capernaum. 
And now he's saying a lot of you don't believe in him. Well, a lot of them don't. <laughs> they sure did come to him. They sure did. They were. I will. I, I admit that what you're what you're raising is an interesting point. Um, and I would I I would ask by the time we get done with the Gospel of John, I would ask the, like where would where is Jesus where is Jesus rejected anyone who's isn't this the, isn't this the seed of the the very very divisive doctrine of predestination? Yeah. Isn't this where it comes from? Do we have a comment online? Yeah. What? Janet? I guess, yeah, I, I, predestination is what hit me when he was talking, but where do you get the idea that the only people who come to him are sent by God? Read it. It says it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It, it says it a number of places. Well, that God sent these people not so that it was an easy grace that Jesus gave them, but to help demonstrate to everybody else that the inclusivity that Daryl is speaking of. That and I guess I would also say, you said, oh, they flocked to see him, but some of it could just be curiosity as opposed to they right. all flocked to see him because they believed in him. It was not. All right. No. Yeah, I think it's very important to, the, 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 that the fact that like this is why Bible study is always done in group uh, is because one person's interpretation of the Bible is dangerous. And so having discourse and dialogue over a scripture verse and, and, and wrestling with it is where like truth and, and meaning is gleaned, which is why um it's always important to do bible study publicly and and, and openly uh and so the uh the the back and forth of like that's not what i'm reading and, and like that's not the way i see it is in, 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 in invaluable it is um it really is how you glean truth from from it and so i appreciate you raising that dick i don't read it that way but I, well, but I see where you're coming from. I don't see how you couldn't, Carol, because... <laughs> wow, that was great. If you start it in plain English about, oh, I don't know, eight, ten times, in starting right about uh, when he's, he tells him, you're treating me like I'm, I'm a Burger King, that's why you came to see me. You know, you didn't come because of the sign, you came because I fed you, and you want more food. And then he goes into the thing about yeah, the bread of life. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but then he said, I'm not going to read every one of them, but he says it a number of times. Those who are the ones who come to me were sent by the Father. Like, would you be willing to yeah. share your version's word, yeah. uh, verse 37? Mine's a revised standard version. It's not my version. What, I have <laughs> what version are you going to use? you have in front of you what is the wording of uh verse 37 verse 37 yeah that's the one we were talking about right that's not what i'm talking about that's what daryl was talking about was verse 37 because jesus says there anyone who comes to me i will never drive away quote unquote in verse 37, uh -huh. <laughs> no one can come to me. Um, this is verse 44. This is just one of them. No one can come yeah, yeah. to me unless drawn by the Father who sent me. Yeah. That's pretty straightforward. No one can come to me unless drawn by the Father who sent me. That's pretty straightforward. I'm not making it up. No, I just, but, I was. I Give Rosanna uh, uh, a chance, but I also uh, Dave, uh, Rosanna and Dave. But what I I'll just say this: what I read there is about a spiritual seeker, and that Jesus will not send away a spiritual seeker. That's that's what I that's what I read there, <laughs> Rosanna. I, I personally don't see a conflict there either. I think it's an affirmation statement by Jesus about the people that are coming to him, coming by way of God. 
I don't even see it as a disconnect. Right. Just an information. Okay. Thanks for that. Dave. I was just thinking people didn't hear God's voice telling them to go to Jesus. I don't think. So maybe people just subconsciously went, didn't know that God was sending them, but just felt this need to go to Jesus. And... I mean, I think that's what, the, I think that's the example of the Nicodemus story, Dave, for me is that someone who is um, intrigued by what he sees and hears from Jesus. And so he goes to him to have this, you know, conversation with him uh, and has this, you know, this, this impactful conversation, you know, through the night. Uh, but I think that's, I think that's what, that's what I, what, what you just shared is what I, what I gleaned from the Nicodemus story. Yeah, right. So people were sent by God, but didn't know that God sent them. But Jesus knows God sent them. Right. That's a good way of looking at it. I like that. Yep. One thing I, I I think about on this is we keep talking about uh, John says they're signs and not miracles. Mm -hmm. Well, how do a lot of Christians come to be Christians? Is there's a sign. There's a sign out there. Why'd you come to church? I don't know. There was a sign. So I think there's the theme of kind of what they're saying and bringing, saying signs instead of miracles, that's where God subconsciously is telling them, you know, hey, here's the sign, you know, move forward, look for Jesus through me or, you know, and stuff like that. That's, that's where I'm coming from, especially um, just... Like I said earlier, this, I've had a rough week and wasn't going to come tonight, and I did, and I just I'm, I'm like, you guys keep talking about the signs and and that, and it just and this chaos thing just got me. You know? <laughs> so, so to me, you know, Dick, I know I know you're you're big in the literal part, but you know, I wasn't baptized until I was 16. I've never taken the scripture as literal. It's always the only thing I do. To you. Oh, well, I don't know. But I mean, that's just actually, you know, I'm, I was, I'm thinking that too much is being read into it. That's what I think. Um, so, great. Okay, we're going to move on. Great conversation. Really appreciate it. But we're going to move on because there's a few more things in chapter six. And then I really do want to get on, on to chapter seven, but at least to be able to touch on it before we, we close. Uh, uh, starting with uh, 52 and all the way through the end of the the sixth chapter is we get we get a very tough teaching of Jesus about uh, flesh and blood and eating and and everything and and I I'm gonna just be perfectly blank and, and clear with you I don't know what to do with this I really do I chew on it no pun intended. Uh, I wrestle with it. I really don't. What I do know is that historically in the first and second century, one of the major um, um, criticisms of Christianity was that it was cannibalistic. And so uh, there, we have um, we have writings from from uh, Roman authorities. Uh, that have been preserved through the centuries, saying that we need to be very careful of this 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 new cult because they they literally eat their people because of things just like this that's in the Gospel of John, of uh, Jesus saying you are to eat my flesh, taking it very literally, um, and so these very tough teachings uh, like this were then used against the the early Christian movement. Um, and because it's right there where it says, you know, you're going to eat my flesh and drink my blood and, and people really didn't know what to do with it, including those who heard it in real time, uh, who then said, all right, I, this is, this is a bridge too far for me and I'm done. And, and they walked away. Craig, are you about well, to ask? I'm just thinking the Catholic Church still <laughs> is thinking, just thinking that they are literally yeah. in Jesus' body yeah. and blood. Yeah, transubstantiation, which, by the way, uh, the, the Eucharist cannot be transubstantiated if there's no gluten. 
No gluten. Yeah, that's a Vatican, that's a Vatican ruling. The, way, the, the Eucharistic wafer has to have gluten. You cannot use a gluten-free Eucharistic wafer, or it cannot be transubstantiated. All right. So, so that's what. That, so, if you ever wanted to know what the secret ingredient to uh, to transubstantiation was, it's uh, it's gluten. Try to if you're gluten sensitive, you can't take it. That is correct. That is correct. Um, so then, is it here? Is at the end of? Okay, so then we get the, we finally get the calling of the twelve at the end of chapter six, which is completely different from any other way the twelve disciples have been chosen in any of the other gospels. It, uh, the, the there's I, I am glad to hear that because when I read that, I thought, wait, a I don't think I've ever heard that. No, how how are the disciples normally called? Um, yeah, come on out of your boat. Yeah, come, come, come out of your boat. Get out of your tax booth. You know, and that's that's how it happens. On the road. Right, right, right. Uh, so here we get a sense that the 12 weren't the ones that were called. They were the ones that were left. <laughs> Which I find that I'm a slightly different than term. Like, there's something different about that. Being like, <laughs> those who stuck with him. Like these are the ones that really were with them through thick and thin. Uh, they heard the eat my flesh bit, and they're like, hey, I, guess I, can still do it. "I guess I can still do it." I don't know what he means by that, but I guess I can still do that. Um, so I always found that to be very fun in the Gospel of uh, John. All right, let's go on to chapter seven, which is only one side of a page, so that's it shouldn't take as long. Um, so in 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 eleven minutes. Let's do the chapter 10. It's only one page. So uh, we start off. So, okay. Oh, here we go. Here we go, Sherry. We know at least what time of year it is. I don't know what year it's in, but I know what time of year it's in because it's the Festival of Booths, which is uh, the Fall Harvest Festival at Sukkot. Uh, if, I don't know if those of you who may have Jewish friends or neighbors, uh, but Sukkot is the... Uh, Harvest Festival for the Jewish community. Uh, it takes place in late September, early October. So about right now. Uh, and uh, so we do know it's fall in Israel and Palestine at this point. Uh, and which would then have brought him back to Jerusalem. And so, uh, but again, does, did anyone see the parallels with the wedding in Cana story? What does his mother want him to do? change the water into wine. What does he say to her? Not it's not my time. It's not my time. Says that here. Right. Says With, he says that to his brothers. Okay, so then again, Jesus not an only child. Another, you know, another thing that some people they're like they forget that he has that he has a family, he has, he has siblings. Uh the other gospels will tell us that he has sisters as well. Um so um so he says the same thing to his brothers that he said to his mother, this is not my time. But then, just like with his mother, he ends up doing what his brothers asked him to do. Anyway, just like with his mother, he ended up doing what she asked him to do anyway, which I thought it was just a, such a great little parallel. She says, turn the water into wine. He says, it's not my time. All right, I'll do it anyway. And then his brothers come and say, hey, let's go to Jerusalem. He's like, it's not my time. All right, I guess I'll go to Jerusalem. Like, so I just, it's just a fun little parallel with his family. Um, and so, so he gets into Jerusalem, and they have not forgotten about the healing on the Sabbath. So again, just I want to just lift this up. That's tight writing. Like that's a callback from a couple of chapters earlier. And the writer of the Gospel of John expects us to remember that story that just happened. Um, and so here, just like we aren't to forget that story, the people in Jerusalem have not forgotten that story. So, Sherry, I would say it hasn't been that long since he's been out of Jerusalem. If, if people are remembering that, because the last time he was in Jerusalem, he was on trial, right? So, so I wrote down, uh, what would take, what would drive Jesus to go to the temple to teach again knowing the last time that he was there, he was put on trial. 
Like, would you go to this temple if you, like, the last time you were there, they were trying to arrest you and, like, put you on trial? Well, I mean, if you're God. You can... Right, right, right. <laughs> you're right down because you're God. I wrote down, <laughs> is he brave? Is he tenacious? Is he arrogant? Oh. Is he naive? I, like, these were words that, like, kind of came up to me, like, what would drive a person with your God? <laughs> you're just like, I can do whatever I want. <laughs> I do what I want. <laughs> that's great. I didn't even think of it that way. Um, that's fun. Uh, but the, the, I was trying to get into the mind of Jesus. Like, he's, is he afraid? Is he, um, is this tenacity? Is this, what is this? Um, and notice he's alone. He doesn't have his disciples with him. He doesn't even go with his brothers. He's there all by himself. Um, so again, he has to defend himself with um, about when he was there the last time he was on trial. He was in literally on trial. Now he's in trial by public opinion. So who he's defending himself now to are the crowds, not to the temple authorities. And so again, he's arguing why it is okay to heal on the Sabbath. And he uses a really great circumcision argument. Well, if it's okay to do circumcision on the if it's like if it's okay to do circumcision on the Sabbath, shouldn't it be okay to be do healings on the Sabbath? Like that's that's the crux of the argument. Um and so um and 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 much like the, the eating of the, uh, the the this is my body and you know you eat my flesh and drink my blood some of them get it some of them don't um, and so we really start to see the the the, the dividing lines of the of of, of the movement um, and the other gospels you get the feeling that there's except for the for the temple authorities and the Sadducees and the and the uh, Herodians and and some of the Pharisees that there was this this groundswell of public adoration for Jesus. Um, in the Gospel of John, you get the sense of like, man, he 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 drove some people away, and other people were and other people flocked to him, and and there there wasn't this this universal groundswell of, of support um and so you just get a, you just get a different picture of what what that ministry was like um but ultimately um he finds a way to you know kind of defend himself with uh with the people and then uh 45 I wrote down 45 why did i write down 45 uh oh so then the pharisees and and uh, and the temple priests they they see this happening and so they send the they, they send the police to arrest him and uh and they don't they don't end up arresting him uh and so if you want to jump to number 45 uh to verse 45 I found this to be such a, a an insightful piece uh, of the gospel. And the, the 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 leadership asked the police, "Why didn't you arrest Jesus?" And the police were like, "Oh gosh, like we couldn't have arrested him. Like he was, <laughs> we've never heard anything like this before." And the Pharisees like lay into him, like like. It felt like uh, okay, so I'm a you know I'm a Gen X junkie. Like it felt like like Cobra Cobra Commander like like yelling at like Cobra or like or like Skeletor talking to his minions. Like how have you been deceived? Like what what is wrong with you? And um and 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 then you get this really sarcastic line to the 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 response by Nicodemus. Which is the Nicodemus' response is like, listen, we don't just like we follow the law, like and, and like there are steps to this. Um and and then they lash out at one of their own and, and Nicodemus, which by the way, good shout out, like all back to Nicodemus, right? So we get to we get to witness Nicodemus's faith journey through the gospel of John as well. He shows up at night, talks with Jesus, then he then he shows up here, he shows up again at the end. Um and the, the Pharisees reply, surely you are not also from Galilee, are you? Um, search and you will see that no prophet is to arise from Galilee. Um, and so 
the that, that that's a very sarcastic line. Surely you're not also from Galilee, um, because I, I don't know why there's such a stereotype for people Galileans, but there's obviously something going on in the first century. That's gospel, that's that's chapter seven, uh, and and really quick to keep us on track because we can't fall behind. We don't have time to fall behind this. Time. Do we know what the reason is that no prophets to arise from Galilee? Uh, and well, there is, um, it's mostly around Bethlehem, Mike. Oh, that's okay. So it's the town from Bethlehem. Right. That's right. I read that. And there's no, and there's no birth story in the gospel of John. So there's no Jesus going to Bethlehem and, and everything like that. So yeah. descended from David and comes from Bethlehem. Yeah. That's the, that's the prophecy is that, is that Bethlehem will be, but Okay. But there seems to be this real snarky. Was that snarky? This is the, the snarky <laughs> attitude about people from Galilee, <laughs> right? Yeah. And uh, because you know, I don't know. I don't know what it is about Galilee that that, that mm -hmm. there is uh, there there is some classic kind of urban rural stuff going on there, um, which is. You know, a story as old as time, um, but but you know maybe I'll look that up a little bit more this week to see if there's if there's something else about why Galileans were were, were looked poorly upon, uh, at least had a bad reputation. Well, this this has an annotation that says uh, for that particular verse, uh, sarcasm expressing the contempt of Jerusalem aristocrats, aristocrats or <laughs> Galilean peasants. Well, there you go. Well, that's, a, that's, what, that's a class thing. Uh, it's a class thing, right. Yeah, yeah it's, that, it's that rural, you know, those bumpkins. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. What do they know? What do they know? Um, and, and Nicodemus is not a bumpkin, you know, he's one of them. And so, uh, any questions or comments online? No? Yeah. One thing. Yeah, this please. kind of goes to what he was talking about. Okay. We're back on that. Side. Okay, good. Okay. The Bible that I have with me today is one that is pretty new. Okay. It was translated from Greek like, to English, so it doesn't go through all those different Yeah, 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 yeah. From Latin to, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it doesn't go. And chapter 37 says, all whom the Father is continuously giving to me, he shall by his choice now come to me. And he that is continuously by his choice coming to me should never ever by my choice be cast out outside. Wow. That is a, that's wordy. A lot of words. <laughs> that's a lot of continuously. <laughs> it's kind of saying what he yeah. was yeah. talking about too. Right. Yeah, no, that's thanks for, for adding that. That's really great. What's the name of that version? I'd love to know. It's the pure word. The pure word. I've never I was it gonna say came like, out not very long ago. Okay. The pure word. I'll look that up. Yeah. I appreciate you sharing that. That's okay. really good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh any other comments or questions? All right. Oh yeah. Great. Would you say that the emphasis in John is is primarily the importance of Jesus' personhood rather than teachings? And if so, is that different than the synoptics? Oh yeah. That, that'd be a great question. Yes. Yeah. But and I think that personhood is an elevated personhood. It's it's not. Whereas Mark is so earthy. And it, it, and it really does it, it, uh, try, it will show, in my opinion, show a very human Jesus. John, I feel, is 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 showing a very very elevated, high Christology. Right? It's a. I think there's a very high Christology in John. Uh, in my in you know in my opinion, the uh, and I do think that's why there are less there are less um there are like hardly any parables at all there's you know there's less miracles and healings in in the gospel of john than anything else and i do think it's i think that's a really astute point it seems like the nicene creed is more emphasis taken more from john than from the gospel mm -hmm. 
yeah, the other three. Not pick up. Yeah, agreed. I think there is a lot out of out of John in that way. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I, but I do think that elevated personhood is is very much the, the goal of John. What, what, why did you choose the word personhood? Because I'm thinking. I mean, throughout history, we tend to want to find a person to you know serve and, and follow. I mean, you get to the point of a cult of personality rather than following principles of value. So yeah, the cult of personality. Because I I think John is just the whole thing is Jesus is God. Period. And so I, I that's the opposite of the person that you're being. Yeah, yeah, that's what I mean by a high Christology. Yeah, yeah, a really high Christology. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, so next week, what was that? Six and seven. So we're on eight and nine next week, and um, and and then, so I hope you enjoy that. But uh, we're going to close as we as we have done with the uh, with the Lord's Prayer. But thanks everybody for coming. I hope you learned something and got something out of tonight. Um, and uh, wherever you head out next, I hope you get there safely. So, but let's close with uh, with the Lord's prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the glory for all. Amen. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night. Thank you, everybody.